A married couple were engaged in some domestic sparring. The husband said, I was a fool when I married you. His wife replied, yes, you were a fool, but I was in love and didn't notice. She said, I should have taken my mother's advice and not married you. He said, did she say that? Yes, she did. And he said, how I wronged that woman. And that introduces the book of Hosea. His marriage was no different to some marriages today. And yet it was unique because God chose a broken hearted prophet with a ruined marriage to speak to the nation. Hosea was a young preacher to the 10 northern tribes of God's people. There had been a civil war that had split the nation. There were the two southern tribes with Jerusalem as the capital. That was Judah and Benjamin to its side. The largest tribe among the ten northern tribes was Ephraim, and he often refers to all the tribes by that name because they were the most influential. And Hosea understands God's feelings through his own. Our God has feelings, and Hosea reflects them. Chapter 1 to 3 are very personal as Hosea meets Goma. Her name means complete and she certainly lived up to her name. In her relationship she was a complete failure. She was or became a prostitute. Scholars debate, did Hosea knowingly marry a prostitute or was this something that she later became? Whatever is said, certainly the seeds had been sown over the years, and it was what she became. And from chapter 4, the message to the nation grows out of Hosea's personal tragedy as to how God feels about his relationship to his people. A preacher's life is blessed or blighted by the woman he marries. And Hosea must have thought, God brought us together, and so this relationship will work. And he was so wrong. And as he tried to save the nation, the relationship drifted. He cares more about his preaching than he does about me. And night after night, he waited for her to come home from... Well, he could only think the worst. I imagine that he prayed long hours that there would be a change of heart, but it didn't get any better. However, they did have a child, and he must have thought, this will surely bring us together. But it didn't. In chapter 1, verse 4, it was worrying when the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Jezreel means to fling away. It's the city where Jezebel was killed. you remember her? She almost single-handed brought a nation to ruin. So God was making the boy an object lesson. It's like a parent calling their boy Auschwitz after the concentration camp. When preaching in Poland, I had a trip there and I was glad that I did, but it was an awful experience. Hosea is naming his son after a disaster. Furthermore, Goma didn't change. But in chapter 1, verse 6, Goma conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. It means not pity. Strange name to give a child. We might call a baby joy, 
but surely not this. Do you see something is going wrong? Verse 8 says, after she had weaned Lo-Ruhama, Goma had another son. Then the Lord said, call him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Another strange name for a child, not mine. At verse 10, God interrupts, showing that eventually it will come good. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted, in the place where it was said of them, You are not my people. They will be called sons of the living God. But after assuring the people, Chapter 2 picks up the story again. Hosea wouldn't divorce her, so she left him. She wasn't going to be tied down. The Paul Simon song, Fifty Ways to Leave Your Lover, sums up her attitude. Just slip out the back, Jack. Make a new plan, Stan. No need to be coy, Roy. No need to discuss much, just... Get yourself free. And Hosea must now be a father and mother to his children who have themselves pleaded with their mother, Mummy, Mummy, don't leave us. But she did. You can almost hear the gossip. There he is telling us how to live. And he can't even control his own home. Give it time and... He will forget her, but he couldn't forget. Goma thought she was bettering herself. Well, she went from man to man, until she was in the hands of a man unable to cope. Hosea went to him. I imagine that when the man saw him, he stiffened and wondered what he was in for. But Hosea wasn't there for a fight. He said... I love my wife, but she doesn't want to be with me. I know that you can't cope, so I am going to give you money to support her. It is not logical for a man to do this. But do you see? Hosea is not acting according to logic, but love. Now, where is this? Chapter 2 and the fifth verse. With reference to the children, their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Then verse 8, look at this. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold which they used for bar. She thanks the wrong person for what she has, a man involved in a perverse religion. Now, before becoming angry with Goma, just ask, have we never been a Goma to God? I mean, we receive much from his hand, but thank ourselves or our friends for what we have achieved, oblivious to the goodness of God in making it all possible. Well, does God love us like this? Yes, he does. And the evidence is the cross where Jesus died, that we might be forgiven and reconciled to a holy God. And that was in God's mind before we were born or had any thoughts toward him. But though Hosea was paying, Goma didn't change. And at the end of chapter 2, Hosea decides to take his hand off her life, hoping that this will bring her to her senses. And in chapter 3, she finally falls into the hands of a man 
who sells her as a slave. Now when a woman was bought as a slave, she was stripped naked so that a man would see what he was buying. Hosea went to the auction. You can almost hear the murmur of the crowd, can't you? He's here to see that she gets what she deserves. But he wasn't there to gloat. And this is astonishing, chapter 3 and the second verse. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethek of barley. He leads her through the crowd and takes her home and says, Goma, I love you and I ask you to live a faithful life. But even if you don't, I will continue to be faithful to you. How can he say and do such a thing? Well, chapter 3, verse 1 is the answer. The Lord said to me, go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. He knew God's love in his heart. Now, from chapter 4, the rest of the prophecy explains God's problem with his people. What do you do with a people you love who reject that love? And the heart of Hosea is God's faithfulness. And the three letters of the word G-O-D for God spell it out. God's love will not let us go, will not let us off, and will not let us down. And checking out the rest of Hosea's prophecy is a jumble of messages that he preached, but he's making these points. Look at a few verses that make each point, because it's the same for us in a relationship with God. First, God's love will not let us go. An important Hebrew word in Hosea is hesed, meaning loving kindness. And chapter 11, verse 8, is an example. The more God called, the further they went away from him. But he says, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? Thank God for emotional, romantic love. But we will never feel secure with God if his love is based on feelings alone, because feelings can change. You know how it goes, I feel it in my fingers, I feel it in my toes, the love that's all around me, and so the feeling grows. Well, you can fall into that kind of love and you can fall out of that kind of love. But the kind of love God has is a loyalty love. A love that will not let us go. Let that go round and round our minds. But balance it with this next factor. God's love will not let us off. Chapter 10 verse 2 is an example. Their heart is deceitful and now they must bear their guilt. There are seven deadly sins these people had. If I quickly run through them, you'll find them all in these chapters. There was their infidelity in their marriages. There was their independence of what God wanted in their worship. He wanted them worshipping in Jerusalem, but they weren't going to go down south. There was their intrigue with their lies and deceit and their idolatry with a golden calf. There was their ignorance of God's word and there was their immorality. It was unsafe on the streets and there was their ingratitude. No thankfulness to God at all. This is serious and God will discipline. 
You know, people talk about the unconditional love of God. But do you realise the Bible never does? Perhaps the way to answer someone who asks, how can a God of love send someone to hell, is to ask, where did you get the idea that God is loving? You see, Jesus did teach the love of God, but he spoke more about hell than he did heaven, plus many other topics we like to dwell upon. By focusing too much on God is love, the outcome may very well be a sentimental notion of God who will take everyone to heaven regardless of what they believe or how they behave. So he becomes a God who serves us, not us, him. This raises a key question. Should we be talking about God's love to the world? Let's note a couple of facts. Number one, there is little about God's love in the Bible. Less than one verse in a thousand mentions God's love. There is no mention in the book of Acts which records the early preaching of the church. We preach it, but we're not repeating the book of Acts as we do so. And number two, every mention of God's love in the Bible is to God in praise or toward believers. God's love is in the category of pearls before pigs. If we talk too generally about it, it's presumed for all and just not appreciated. In fact, mention God's love to an unbeliever and they will fire back at you. How can a loving God allow the suffering that there is going on in this world? There is no understanding that this is a fallen world and that God doesn't need to do anything to put us in the right with him and prepare an eternal home where there will be no more tears, but he has. John 3.16 is called the gospel in a nutshell. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I think it's the most misinterpreted verse in the New Testament. You see, it does not say that God loves the world. It says that God loved the world, which means to do something once. So God on one occasion loved the world. In what way did God once love the world? Well, Jesus was referring back to what happened in the history of God's people. You can read about it in the book of Numbers how that they grumbled despite all the benefits God had given to them. And God said, I need to teach you a lesson here. And snakes came among them and they were dying. But when Moses put up a pole with a snake on it and they could look towards that, that was their means of salvation. And Jesus applied it to what would happen with his coming and his death on the cross. Be careful how we talk about God's love to unbelievers, because they may just jump to the wrong conclusion. The only exercise some people do is jumping to wrong conclusions. Oh, well, God is love. I can do what I like. I can always be accepted by him. In fact, if we only speak about God as love, we may drive people away from church. Reports on why people stop coming to church show this. They are told God loves you just as you are. It doesn't produce respect for God, but the opposite. It reduces our worship to God as our best friend. But where is the awe of God? And what about the New Testament description of God as a raging fire? The Bible does not say God loves us unconditionally. It says God loves those who fear him. A word that describes God in the Bible is now hardly ever used. God is righteous. It's what the world needs to know. When Jesus prayed, he never said, loving Father, we do. 
and I wouldn't want to stop anyone from saying it, but he prayed, Holy Father, and he prayed, Righteous Father. And thank God that he is righteous, meaning he is and will be absolutely fair. And because God is righteous, he will discipline us. Did you know that an attribute of God is a moth? In Hosea 5.12, God says, I am like a moth to Ephraim. Who wants to be a moth-eaten Christian? The next metaphor he gives is, I will be like a lion. And who wants to meet a lion on their terms? I've been preaching in Kenya, Tanzania and Namibia and had an opportunity to take some time on a safari while I was there. And I went into areas where there were lions, but I tell you this, I stayed in the vehicle with the windows well and truly secured. By the way, don't make hasty assumptions when life falls apart that God doesn't love us anymore. That's the problem that Job had with his friends and the theological abuse that he had still goes on in churches to this day. Well, you're like you are and you're having this trouble because of the sin in your life. Actually, he was better than any of them. He just lived in a fallen world. And this was one of the consequences of all of that. And he was going to prove through how he was that he wasn't going to give up on God. Even if he slayed me, I will still trust him. God will make it clear if it is his discipline of us. And there is only one type of person he disciplines, and that is his child. Like any good parent, wanting the best for their children. God doesn't let us go, but he doesn't let us off. But don't stop there, because God will not let us down. We can return to him. Chapter 14, verse 1, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. I love this prayer. O oh God of new beginnings and second chances, here I am again. And notice how we can return. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Sin leaves our body through our mouth. You see, it's as we confess with our lips what we believed in our heart, that God will save us. So say, thank you to the Lord for his forgiveness. Thank you to the Lord for his acceptance of us so undeserved, because he is the kind of God that we can return to. He'll not let you go, won't let you off, but he doesn't let you down. So take words with you. Tell him what's on your heart. Confess and God will love us freely and forgive us instantly. Sometimes people will ask, why do we need to take words with us? In fact, when we pray at all, why do we need to pray specifically about anything? And the Bible says God knows our needs. So why do we even have to tell him anything? Well, it's because the Lord loves dependence. There was a famous play called The Barretts of Wimpole Street, in which the two main characters were Robert and Elizabeth, husband and wife. And in a moment of weakness, she cried and said, Oh, Robert, how can you love me so much when I am so weak? And his words to her were, my strength needs your weakness as much as your weakness needs my strength. And what is the value of being infinitely strong when you can't apply it to those who voice their need and their dependence? So take words with you. Talk to God. Be specific. I will heal 
their waywardness and love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the Jew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. That to me is beautiful. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. A fragrance is not useful, but it is a delight to smell something. Oh, that's great. And God is saying, you will become my delight. I delight in you. And children of the living God know that today. God delights in us. He hears our prayers, our songs of worship, and the attitude of love in our hearts. And it's like a sweet smelling aroma, a fragrance. Hosea is a heartfelt message from a heart sick prophet about a heart broken God. He spoke it like it was, and he reveals not only the truth about these people, but he tells them the truth about a loving, gracious, forgiving God. And if we will take words with us and confess our sins, we will find God will love us freely. Do we want to live wisely and well? We can. Chapter 14, verse 9 asks, Who is wise? He will realise these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walking them. But the rebellious stumble in them. Let me put that the best way I know how. People will tell us to do more. I say, do less. You see, the world doesn't need more of us. It needs more of God. And God waits to fill us with his presence and thus to fill us with his love and his life. And we are wise for time and eternity to respond to him. A young businessman met a young woman. They were soon in love, married, and enjoyed three lovely years together. But then she caught a virus that affected her mind. There were times when she would scream out for long hours and act unreasonably. Doctors tried to help, but nothing seemed to work except drugs to help her sleep. One physician suggested relocating to an area she had known as a child. Maybe it would trigger something in her brain that would help. Well, they did, but it didn't seem to do very much. But on a day when she was fairly at peace, he suggested they go for a car journey and explore the beautiful countryside. Driving home, she fell into a deep, sleep. She didn't wake when arriving home. He gently picked her up and carried her into the house and to the bedroom. He lay her down on the bed and he sat by her side as she slept on. He was looking at her in love, stroking in her hand, thinking of the lovely bride that he had lost but determined to do for her anything that would help. It was the early hours of the morning when he woke up. He realised that he had dozed off and that she had her eyes open now and was looking around the room and then looking directly at him in a different way. As she looked at him, it wasn't a blank stare. And she said, hello, I seem to have been on a long journey. Where have you been? And he said, right here, waiting for you all this time. 
welcome home. And I love you. And where is God? Right here, waiting for us.